Mm. Conversation about conversations feels so meta to me, you know, like you're going to listen to this conversation about how to have better, specifically sex, love, and relationship, underline the sex a few times, relationship conversations with your significant other or potentially future significant others. Um, I would say I, I poll our audience pretty regularly and I ask them questions like, what do you think gets in the way of having great intimacy? And they're like, poor communication. I'm like, yeah, I could see that. That's probably the the vast majority of what gets responded is poor communication. I think, yeah, Yeah, there's probably um, a mix of things, but regardless of what the other things are, if you can't talk about the other things, then I could see that communication at large is a big fat challenge for so many people. And so this, my that sick sex chick listeners is the combo of all combos then because it is about combos. And to have this conversation, I have not one, but two special guests for you. It is very rare that it is a two-on-one situation where it's me by myself and another couple of people. And I'm so thrilled to have Vanessa and Xander on the show to talk about sex talks. Thanks so much for having us. We're really excited to be here. Oh, thank you. Yay. Okay. So I hear my, my husband in my head, like if he were having this, if he were a part of this, if this were a foursome, he would take the mic and go, okay, so how did you two meet? (laughs) (laughs) So I'm just going to channel my inner Jordan for a minute. And, uh, I would love to hear a little bit of y'all's love story. And of course, this is, this is not something that was on my little, my little list of questions. Um, I'm curious, you know, how you two met. And then of course, how you wound up working together because my husband and I work together as well. Oh, yes. Uh, No, we're always happy to tell our love story. I think no couple gets tired of telling your story, right? It's so cute. So we met in San Francisco in 2007, a Christmas party at Xander's house. I had a friend at the time who was dating one of Xander's friends, and she really wanted me to go be her wing woman at this party. I did not want to go, was not in the mood for going out that night. I just wanted to go home. But the selling point for this party was that it was four blocks from my house. So I thought, okay, you know what? I'm just going to go like drop her off at the party. She'll see her guy. And then I can just sneak out the front door and walk home. This is perfect. (laughs) But there were other plans. There were other plans. The universe had other plans for us. So I walked into the party and very quickly she grabbed me and she said, do you see that guy DJing over? Over there. He thinks you're really cute. And I thought, oh, he does. Very interesting. And what I would come to find out later is that Xander's friend, who was dating my friend, had also pulled him aside and said, do you see that girl that just walked in? She thinks you're really cute. So I was very emboldened thinking, oh, this is easy. This guy already likes me. He thinks I'm cute. I was I was emboldened <laughs> just the same. He was stuck behind the DJ booth, though. So I snuck back there. I knew all of the songs that he was playing. So I think I impressed him and we started talking and it just immediately hit it off. It was kind of game over right from the get go. And then we found out after the fact that neither of us had said anything about (laughs) the other one (laughs) and our friends hadn't even coordinated with each other to set us up. They had just independently each decided to lie to us. (laughs) Yeah. Lies. The basis for a great (laughs) relationship, but no, it it worked out great for us. And great friendships. Yeah. (laughs) So the way that we started working together was that I initially started this business. I knew that I wanted to be a sex therapist basically my entire life. I wrote a book with Xander called Sex Talks. And really my interest in this topic boiled down to my parents' attempt at giving me the talk, which as is the case with most people, was very uncomfortable, very awkward. And it really stuck with me, this discomfort. It it planted this seed in the back of my head of why is sex so uncomfortable to talk about? Why is it so embarrassing? And so as I got older, I kept coming back to that. And I eventually realized, you know what? I think this is my mission. I think it's my mission in the world to help people feel more comfortable and open talking about sex. So I went to undergraduate, studied human sexuality and sociology. That was when I moved to San Francisco after graduation. It was taking a little bit of time to figure out 
oh, do I actually do this whole sex therapy thing? (laughs) And we met at that time. And then I eventually went back to grad school. I decided I wanted to go the psychotherapy route. So I went to grad school, got my degree, became a licensed psychotherapist, and initially started off seeing people one-on-one in that traditional psychotherapy model. And I realized pretty quickly, you know, my practice filled up immediately. I was saying the same things over and over again. And I started thinking, how can I serve more people? Obviously, I'm onto something here, but I want to like be able to reach a wider audience of people. So I started creating online courses and they took off very quickly. And I invited Xander to like help me out behind the scenes. So he kind of turned into the operations officer, helping run everything in the background so I could focus on the content. But I had another little sneaking suspicion in the back of my head. I kept going back to that idea of talking about sex. And I thought, you know, I think there's something here about the two of us being able to talk about sex together as a real couple, as a couple who has really struggled to talk about sex in our own relationship and had our own ups and downs and our own journey with that. But Xander had some different thoughts. I had had reservations. I mean, I never thought I was going to be doing this, right? Like I met Vanessa and I was like, God, it's so cool. I'm dating, I'm dating this woman who wants to be a sex therapist. Like my friends are going to think I'm so cool. Like (laughs) I'm so good in bed, right? Because like, we just want to project to everybody else that we're great in bed, even though maybe we have some insecurities or concerns ourselves about, about, you know, what's really going on for us. And, you know, that's, that's kind of like the basis for what went on in our relationship for a long time. Like I wanted to be that guy that had everything, you know, had my shit together. And, you know, I liked talking with Vanessa about the types of issues that other people might have around sex. I didn't really want to focus on any of the issues we might have until they were really front and center in our relationship. Like things went from being really hot and heavy early on to life catching up and then not so hot and heavy. And we weren't having very much sex. And I was working really hard in my career and I didn't have a lot of time uh, for intimacy. I didn't have a lot of energy. And my wife is asking me, you know, like, why aren't we having more sex? And I'm feeling really bad about myself. And the last thing I wanted to do was, talk about what was going on. Um, Eventually, you know, we got into therapy. I realized, hey, it's actually better to ask for help and talk about these kinds of things because you actually have a chance of them getting better. Um, But anyway, when Vanessa was asking me, you know, if I wanted to be involved, I'd watched her put all this time and effort into getting licensed, getting trained, building up a practice. And I was like, no one wants to hear from me. What do I have to offer? Like, I'm just a regular dude. And Vanessa was like, no, that's what people want to hear. They want to hear the regular guy's perspective. Like how have, how have we in our relationship dealt with some of these issues? You know, what would I tell people now knowing what I know now? And so I slowly got more and more involved and started to realize that, yeah, like it's great to have that psychotherapy training to have like the academic background, but what people really want is a mix. Like they want the the information but they also want the practical like here's how a real couple does it so i'm so happy to be here now (laughs) it's so great and eerily similar in some ways you know i was doing this i was doing work in sex love and relationships in the space sex educating and then met my now husband and he was like you're you tell people with their sex lives cool you know (laughs) does that mean we get to have threesomes or what? You know, like he, (laughs) he was just so like, oh, wow. Awesome. But you know, as time went on, it it brought its own sense of insecurities of Mm -hmm. like, oh, this was a cool, alluring, sexy thing. And then as time went on, it was a, is she, am I good enough? It Mm -hmm. wait, if we're not having sex as much as, you know, as like a client of hers or people that are talking to like, if we're not doing it, then what does that mean about us? And should we, should, yeah. it's just all these shoulds. Um, and so, and then it is real. And I think that, that, you know, some of the stuff that I share that winds up landing so much is exactly what you were just talking about. It's like, like, just because we have a brand and a business and a podcast and all that, that's, that's helping people with their sex lives. Doesn't mean that we're not also challenged by it you know, at times in the varying cycles and seasons that, that come with being a human, you know, everyone, even the person who has gone and gotten multiple degrees in the subject and helps hundreds, 
I was going to say hundreds, if not thousands. So definitely thousands and thousands of people, um, you know, with y'all's work, it's like, it's happening there too. No one is exempt. No culture is exempt, no nationality, no race, no ethnicity. No, none, no one's exempt from challenges when it comes to intimacy, sex, Mm -hmm. um, at large intimacy at large and sex for sure. And so, um, yeah, that it's just the, the work that, you both do that. I know that we do behind the scenes over here too. It's so important. And I'm like, want to give everybody a megaphone. It's like, once you understand, like, this is, this is just as important as the rest of the stuff that you might do to personally develop, you know, it's how do you, how do you show up in sex? How do you show up in your own romance? Like that's, that's so telling. Um, and so it starts a lot of times with being able to talk about it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much of the book of sex talks is inspired by ways that we tried to about, talk about our sex life and or went not horribly talk or wrong. Not talk about it. Yeah. I mean, we made so many mistakes in those early years of approaching each other in the wrong ways of avoiding conversations, you know, so we've really been on our own journey and the book is very deeply personal and intimate. I mean, the beginning of it, the literal first page of the introduction starts off with us going to therapy. So it was really important to us to share, like, we're not perfect either. We've had our own journey and the journey is not over yet. Like we, we haven't, you know, come to this magical, perfect place now. Like, yeah, we still have ups and downs and seasons too. So I think it's really important to lead with that vulnerability and show people like, it's okay. If your sex life doesn't look like what it does in the movies and TV and porn, ours doesn't either, but we do have some cool tricks and tips and techniques for helping it get to a better place. Yeah. I think people these days, it's especially, you know, where social media is the way it is. Like people are just kind of disenchanted with expert advice or people who look like everything is too buttoned up, right? Like people are smart now on social. It's like, oh yeah, like your life looks perfect. It's probably not perfect. Or like, oh, it's easy for you to give that expert opinion. But like, how do you actually do that in your real life? And that's, you know, that's kind of like when everything changed for us was when we were like, yeah, like, let's actually, let's just go all in and talk about what actually goes on for us. Cause that it makes it so much easier to relate and so much easier to actually start doing the work when, cause so many people look at us and go, oh, you must just have a perfect sex life. Like you must just have it all figured out. And so like, the only way for me to be like you is to like jump from, you know, he, like, you know, from zero to 10. And it's like, no, <laughs> one, we're not at 10. And we got <laughs> right. to wherever we got to by just going step by step through it. Right. Right. Well, I would love to dig into some of those, some of the things that you look back on and you're like, we messed it up. It's not really a mess up. You know, it's not like a, <laughs> we made mistakes if they eventually lead to the breakthrough and then the aha and all of that. So it served a purpose too, but I would love to hear about what some of those mistakes looked like and then how they then translated over time into the breakthroughs and the ahas and, um, and an even better sex life. So the first one is what we start the book with. So like Xander was saying, you know, when we met, it was super hot and heavy between the two of us. You know, we definitely had that chemistry, that excitement. And I think for both of us, we really took it kind of as a sign from the universe. Like, oh, this has got to be my person. Like it's effortless. It's Mm -hmm. easy. It's so great. And so then we get like, a year, two years into the relationship, we've moved in together and life just catches up. Like there was nothing remarkable about what was going on at that time. I think probably 98% of people in long-term relationships have experienced something like this. It's like life just catches up and sex starts to feel like it's harder to have it. You don't have the energy. It's not as exciting when you do have it. It feels routine and predictable and just nowhere near as exciting as it used to be. Sorry, (laughs) just choked on something. So I think both of us experienced fear around that. Like what Mm -hmm. happened to us? What happened to this undeniable chemistry that we used to have? And even to ourselves, like for me, it was what happened to this really vibrant and vivacious, like super sensual person that I felt like I was at the beginning of the relationship. So the mistake that I made at that time 
was I really like attacked Xander with that. You know, I, I didn't say anything until it felt like I had all this resentment that was starting to boil up. And I came in hot and heavy and I was asking questions like, you know, why aren't we having sex? Why do you never initiate? Why don't you seem to want me? Which of course just put him straight under the defensive. <laughs> yeah, so that of course I felt super defensive. I wanted to, you know, I felt motivated to try to pick apart her arguments of like, oh, and you know, it's like, oh, well, how can we never have sex? So then that pivots to me talking about, well, oh, well, we had sex one week ago. We, you know, we did this or, or I would be focused on like, oh, well, you know, this, this really busy work project is about to end. And as soon as that ends and everything is going to go back to normal. So, you know, me feeling like, just feeling like, okay, well, just, this one little thing is going to change. And then like, don't worry, everything's going to go back to normal. Like I got this, I got to figure this out on my own. So it started pivoting into like, I got to figure this out on my own. Um, and, and then I just felt really alone and emasculated and yeah, like lost. And I think for many years, we really only talked about our sex life when there were problems. Like right. we need to fix this. This is an issue. I don't like this. Yeah. And so it would be like, oh God, she's, she said the word sex. And I immediately uh -huh. like, I'm on the defensive. I feel really yucky about it. I feel bad about myself. I feel ashamed. So we learned over time to be like a little bit softer with those conversations and communicate better about them. But it was still like, yeah, only when sex was an issue would we talk about it. And it really wasn't until we started working together that all of a sudden now we are talking about sex on a daily basis, you know, and it's in this, it's a professional way. Like, oh yeah, we have to send out this email about initiation or we're working on this course about how to have a amazing foreplay. So we're talking about sex in this more objective sense, like every day and our sex life started getting really good. And eventually we realized like, I think there's a really big power in talking about sex when there's not something wrong with it. <laughs> it seems very obvious now looking back on it, but that was such a huge realization for us of talking about sex in a positive way, like creating this positive foundation of communication. It made it feel so much more fun and exciting. It made it feel easier when there inevitably were challenges that we needed to talk about. It also kept sex more top of mind for both of us. So we're thinking about it more, then it starts to feel easier to initiate with each other, to have the enthusiasm and the excitement to be intimate with each other. And so that was really like the early kernel of sex talks of how do we get couples to stop talking about sex only when it's bad and get them to create this positive foundation and this positive association with talking about sex. Mm. I love that. I love that so much because I see that too, for sure. And and just looking at my life, like looking backwards, it it's it's been very similar to what you're saying. It's like, oh, I'm holding this in. I'm holding this in. I'm building resentment. And now I'm walking on eggshells. And now it's like, when is the person gonna just like erupt or like bring up the subject? Um, and and it's kind of this wild um phenomenon of sorts. And I don't know if, if this resonates for y'all, but growing up, I mean, I grew up in South Louisiana and very kind of Catholic upbringing, but I was always taught lots of things, but it was, um, it was that sex wasn't the reason why like you choose a partner. It's like the sex kind of just comes along with them. It's like you, because it, because, well, first off, you were supposed to not have sex until like, mm -hmm. married, right? <laughs> and so it was, you know, choose them because of their their vision and drive and what they want in life and all these other reasons. And then and and then you get married and then you have sex and then you work on your sex life. It was some some kind of variation of that. But basically this notion that sex is like a secondary thing, you know, all these other qualities are first and then that's, you know, secondary or further down the line. But I've had multiple relationships end where that was the primary reason they were great in all these other facets and all this, but we couldn't align when it came to sex. And, you know, and I look back and I'm like, okay, well, those people weren't my people, my husband's my person. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't feel any kind of way, but I, I do wonder if I would have been able to just talk about this in a different way, if we would have, you know, could that relationship at least ended a little bit more smoothly, you know, mm -hmm. where we felt less shame on both sides and mm -hmm. felt less, you know, weighed down by how it ended and all of that. And so 
um, I see just the, the for sure relevance and like learn to have this conversation early on frequently, you know, when it's, when it feels good, you know, when sex Mm -hmm. is still doing like, it's, it's, you're still sexing, you know, (laughs) (laughs) not when it's like, Oh, I think a week just went by. Was that our longest stretch of not having sex? When's it going to happen again? What are we going to do? Should we talk about Mm -hmm. this? No, I'll just let a few more days go by. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. No, we've been getting a lot of questions about sex talks because it is a book for couples to, you know, to talk about your sex life. But a lot of people are asking us, well, you know, I'm dating. Is it still useful for me to read this? And absolutely it is because I think if you can go into a relationship already knowing these five key conversations that we think are going to transform any couple's sex life. If you go into a relationship with that understanding and that information, it helps you start to set that foundation early. And it's not like you're going in on the first date and like, okay, here's conversation one, let's do it. (laughs) But it just, you know, it helps you be prepared. But even if you are in a relationship where you've been together years or decades and you haven't really talked about sex, first of all, you are not alone. It, It is unbelievable how many couples have really never talked about their sex life openly. Yeah. I mean, whether, yeah, whether or not like it's kind of been conditioned from like a religious perspective or even just from a pop culture perspective, Uh because like you see like TV and in the movies, there, there may not be any like religious message in there, but there's certainly a, like everybody does it, but they don't talk about it. Nobody talks about what they like. Nobody talks about what worked, what didn't work. It all goes off so smoothly. And then they just like jump up and go off to do something else so of (laughs) course everybody thinks you know whether it's like well we're not supposed to be having sex so therefore we can't talk about it like or like we're supposed to be having sex but we certainly aren't supposed to talk about it because nobody else does (laughs) like of course you get that message yeah so even if you are in that situation of you haven't talked about it for years or decades like it's never too late to just get started yeah absolutely i and in a lot of ways i can imagine that is out of all the types of awkward that I felt in my life, I imagine just, you know, an imagination land that that is more awkward or harder than having a conversation with someone that you're on like date three with, mm-hmm. you know, cause there's yeah, a lot it's... less at stake, you know, with the person that you've been maybe married to or in a relationship with for a long time. And it's like, Oh, we're getting ready to, we're getting ready to open, open up some dialogue that like has been inside of me for our entire relationship. And you know everything about me except this. Yeah, I think especially, you know, if we're not talking about it or we've never talked about it, it's very easy for us to create these stories in our heads of feeling like we must be on wildly different pages. You know, oh, we're not having sex. So it must be because my partner's not attracted to me anymore. I never snapped back after having a baby and my partner doesn't like my body or maybe they're having an affair. Like we can go to some pretty wild places in our heads. But what I think is so important to remember is that the likelihood is that you and your partner are so much closer to being on the same page than you realize. Like you both want to feel close to each other. You want to have emotional and physical intimacy. You want to have sex that's pleasurable and playful and fun. Like, sure, there might be small differences in exactly what that looks like for the two of you, but it's not like you're on completely different pages and, oh no, now I'm going to have the conversation and realize like, we're t- so different. Like, you know. Yeah. I mean, and not only that, you're both very likely feeling super awkward and super anxious. That's actually something, to something bond to over. bond over, to relate over. But instead, we just kind of close up and go, like, oh, like it must be me. I must be the problem, or it must be this other problem. Mm. I am very curious for our listeners here if you could share what the five conversations are. Absolutely. So we took this really big concept, this idea of talking about sex. It feels huge, right? You're like, where do I even start? And so we wanted to really create a book that would be very practical and guide people through exactly how to have these conversations. So one of our biggest pet peeves is generic advice. You know, you read the article online and it's like, just talk to your partner about it. And you're like, 
okay, but how? Yeah. So we wanted to do something that was completely different from that. So we spent a lot of time thinking about what do we think are the most important conversations? Like you could spend a lifetime talking about sex, but like what are the, those core conversations, those core topics? And we identified five that we think for any couple, any relationship are going to be transformational. So the first conversation that we start off with is acknowledgement. And this is really just setting that positive foundation that we were talking about, just getting comfortable with sex as a topic of conversation. Yeah, it's like sex is a thing and we have it. Yeah. So the conversations <laughs> are also, they're in a specific order for a specific reason. And we really wanted to start with something that felt manageable and doable. So that's that conversation. Yeah. Because so many people haven't ever really had that, just that proper acknowledgement that like, you yeah, we have sex, we have a sex life. <laughs> and so then what happens is when the topic of sex comes up, like without having had that acknowledgement conversation, we immediately go to why, like, oh, why are they bringing this up? And we start spinning that story. Oh, it must be because of this. We go down, you know, the road of inference or whatever. So that's why it's so important to be able to have that basis of acknowledgement so that when you, you know, when you do need to talk about something else, you're not immediately on guard. So the second conversation is connection. What do we need to feel close to each other? So this conversation is actually all about emotional intimacy. A lot of couples in long-term relationships tell us we feel like we've become roommates rather than romantic partners. We feel like we're ships passing in the night and you have this experience of, it's like you get into bed at the end of the night and your partner starts crawling in on their side and it's like, ah, who are you? <laughs> like, I've felt so disconnected from you all day. So this conversation is about about how to create more of that connection so that sex doesn't feel like such a big leap, like there's not such a huge gulf between the two of you. The third conversation is desire. What do we need to feel turned on and get excited about being intimate with each other? Another topic that for so many couples in long-term relationships, it's like, where the hell did the desire go? How do I get it back? Yeah. Or it's like, well, I'm just waiting around for it to happen. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not anything that I am an active participant in. And it's like, no, there's actually all kinds of ways that we, we can be a team about this and we can actually take some action to create some desire. Create it. Exactly. Then that leads us into conversation for pleasure. What do we need to feel good to have a satisfying and exciting experience. And so this is all about really understanding more about what you need and how to communicate that to your partner. And the book is really meant to be very inclusive, but we do spend a little bit of time talking specifically about a very important dynamic that comes up in male-female relationships, the orgasm gap. So how to make sure that both partners are having a great experience. And we also make this connection between enjoyment and desire, which it's very obvious when you hear it, but a lot of people just don't make that connection. If you're not having sex that feels enjoyable and satisfying and pleasurable, it makes no sense for you to crave it. So low sex drive is the number one complaint that we hear from our community. And we always love to start with that question. Like, well, tell us about the sex that you are having. So those chapters are right next to each other for a very specific reason. <laughs> and then we wrap it up with conversation five, exploration. What do we want to try next? So this conversation is all about another very generic piece of advice that you hear often, like keep it spicy, try new things. <laughs> And it actually is very good advice, but most of us struggle with the execution. We feel like, well, I don't, I don't even know what to do. Like my partner asks me in the moment, like, what do you want? And you're like, I don't know. Yeah. It's like either, <laughs> either you freeze up or you think, oh, I have to do something extreme or very out of the ordinary for us. Mm -hmm. So this chapter is all about like how to explore what the options are. We will give you a whole menu of them and to make specific plans for actually trying new things with each other. Mm, beautiful. And so if you were to have a larger conversation, but just in that particular order, then that's the theory, right? That at, that at the end, you know what to do. 
Yeah. Right? I mean, I think, yeah, we, like I was saying, like, we want this to feel like a really approachable book. We know people are nervous talking sure. about sex. We all have sure. a lot of, you know, hangups and shame that we've been taught to have. So we want to make it feel really manageable. So we recommend like having one conversation at a time. And even within right. each of the, each of the mm-hmm. five talks, like there are little subtopics. So you could break it down even further than that. So we, we guide you through how to identify like what feels like a good enough <laughs> amount of of uh, of content to cover in one go. So we don't want anybody feeling like you've got to carve out a whole weekend to have this like marathon conversation totally. going through all of them. <laughs> totally. But if you get really practiced in it, then you might be like kind of ninjing, you know, or it's like a little <laughs> bit of each one and then you get to, okay, and then what do we want to try next, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I can see definitely um, the importance of having more expanded, extensive conversation of each one of those things, especially if people have not done it maybe ever in their lives before. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and I can't imagine how much more, uh, how much closer they'll feel to their partner, even just in, in talking. Um, and so I love to double click on a couple of the things that you mentioned that were inside of the, the various talks. And you mentioned, um, enjoyment and desire, and then also, um, just the general low sex drive conversation. Cause you said that's mm-hmm. something that comes up a lot. And I know that that's something that comes up for our audience as well. And so I'd love to get y'all's tips on how to navigate that and whether that's in conversation or in practicality, you know, mm-hmm. what happens, what would you suggest for people who are dealing with maybe one partner has low sex drive or both parties have low sex drive, or just they're consistently kind of ebbing and flowing and differing in their desire for sex. Sex drive is a very complex topic and there are a lot of different things that can feed into it. But what we've found is that there tend to be three key reasons why somebody feels a low sex drive. So one is this enjoyment desire connection that we were talking about, that the sex that they're having, it isn't actually worth craving. So we're big foodies. We make a lot of food comparisons. Sometimes the way I like to describe this one is like, do you ever find yourself craving a bowl of mushy, overly steamed broccoli? Like, no, we don't. Of course not. <laughs> but I think a lot of us are having sex. That's the equivalent of overly steamed broccoli and we're judging ourselves for it. So if we really address the pleasure aspect of it, very often you'll find that the desire naturally falls in place after that. So that's a big one. The second one is pain. And this is something that does not get talked about enough at all. Um, There was a study that found that one in three women experienced pain the last time she had sex, which is just a mind boggling number. Yeah, not like ever the last time. Yeah. And so I I think it's really important for us to recognize that our bodies are hardwired to avoid pain. You don't ever find yourself wondering like, why don't I ever crave putting my hand on a hot stove? What's wrong with me that I never want to stub my toe really hard on the stairs? Like, no, it doesn't make any sense to want a painful experience unless we're talking about like a kinky sexual pain. Yeah. That's a totally different thing, <laughs> but we'll put that aside for now. Um, but it, yeah, it just doesn't make sense for us to crave something that feels uncomfortable, painful in a bad way. So being able to address sexual pain is a huge, huge thing. And And then the third of the top three reasons that we see is that it's actually a a sign of emotional disconnection where there are relationship issues coming up. So a lot of times we'll ask people like, okay, tell us you have a low sex drive. What's going on in your relationship? And they'll say, oh, well, we've been fighting a lot. We just can't seem to get on the same page about our approach to parenting. And you know what? We haven't had a date night in probably months. And the last time that we did it, we were fighting the whole time then too. It's just like- Yeah, you can't compartmentalize your sex life. Yeah. There, it just does not work that way, especially in a long-term relationship where, you know, completely intertwined, like the emotional well-being of our relationship is completely intertwined with the physical. So those are three amazing starting points to take a look at if you feel like your sex drive is low. And the interesting thing you'll notice, not one of those three were hormones or like erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. I think those are like the two things that people tend to jump to as like, as like, oh, this must be what's wrong. And, and I get it because we love to, we love to want to try to quantify something. So we go, oh, well, if I can just get this test and like the result says that I'm low and then I can take this pill that is going to maybe change that, then, you know, of course that's what we want to do. But 
the, the reality is, is that for the vast majority of people, those things are not actually impacting your desire, your sex drive in a very meaningful way. And there's, it's actually, you know, unfortunately, you know, it are, there are these squishier, more gray area type of things that you need to address. But on the flip side, like they are things that are within your, you know, your individual or your joint control. They're things that you can talk about. They're things that you can work on. And if you work on any one or all of those three things, they are going to vastly improve your, your well-being in general and your happiness, which, you know, way more than like just taking a pill would. Yeah. And they're also, it's important to recognize too, like they should be enjoyable things to work on too. Yeah. Like creating, you know, more pleasure during sex. It's it's not like the assignment here is like, okay, well, you have to work on holding your breath for as long as possible. You know, it's like, it should be bringing more pleasure into sex should be a pleasurable experience. Absolutely. And, and I feel that too, like um, a lot of people I'll hear, oh, well, you know, my sex drive is low and should go get my hormones checked. I hear that over and over and over again. I've actually had some people come onto the show and talk about when hormones are playing a role, though, even if you've got hormones out of whack, like um, after having a baby or going through menopause or whatever the situation is, um, going through really stressful stuff that's going on in life, whatever it could be affecting them, it still doesn't make you want to have sex with someone that you don't actually like. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like it doesn't matter. You can get them. Yep. They could be firing on all cylinders. Hormones are great. <laughs> and it's not going to make you want that person that you can't stand right now because, exactly. you know, some stuff is off in your relationship. And I always get a giggle out of that. I'm like, yeah, check them if you really, really want to check them. But there's also many other things that you can do. Um, mm -hmm. before, you know, or in tandem with, because for, yeah. I think, especially for Americans, like we, I've gathered after extensive global travel that we really like our prescriptions. It's like, we want the mm -hmm. diagnosis and we want, oh, this fix doctor says this, and then this is what fixes. And I take, and then I'm good. Right. And, um, and that's often not the whole picture, you know, and yeah. for a lot of people, that's not it at all. Yeah. I, and I, I totally sympathize with the desire for a magic pill. I mean, I have had so many instances in my life where I would just love the magic pill that fixed whatever issue it was that I was having. Like who wouldn't want a quick and easy solution to any of life's challenges. And at the same time, like it, that's just not how our sex lives work. And it's, it's so important to be able to, uh, you know, acknowledge that. And again, to recognize that like the ways that we want to encourage people to work on their sex lives, it should be enjoyable things. It shouldn't feel like, you know, going to the dentist and getting a tooth pulled type of thing. Right. You got great analogies, stub in the toe, hand on the hot <laughs> skillet. Now we're at the dentist. Like, okay, this is what examples of what not to do. Okay, yeah. folks. <laughs> so I have a bit of a shift in the, in the questions here. And that's what happens when the talks feel good, you know, as I, I've experienced this before where like, okay, there's been some relief you know, whether it's myself or people in our community, there's been relief. We've talked about it, but now what? So even have talked about the action, but maybe there's a lack of initiation or maybe they don't know who's supposed to do what, um, but the combo happens, but then they're feeling a little defeated because nothing happened after. Mm -hmm. Well, this yeah. has happened. To, this has been a part of our story. You know, that, that was a part of our story for a very long time. We would, you know, you know, we would not bring things up in the greatest way. We would muck our way through it. There would be a lot of grand promises and plans for things that would change. And then things, you know, maybe would change for a week or so. And then they would just slide, slide right, back. right back to normal. That That's inertia for you. I think one of the mistakes that a lot of us make and again, this really can get compounded if you're not talking about sex regularly, is we make this grand plan, you know, these very big things that we're going to do. And it's very similar to when New Year's rolls around. And it's like, I'm going to go to the gym every single day. I'm going to be there for two hours a day. I know I've only gone to the gym like three times the previous year, but I'm really committing to this. And when we, you know, it's great to like get excited about something and to want to take action. But when we make it too big, it just starts to feel very overwhelming. And then that first day that you miss going to the gym, it's just sort of like, well, 
I didn't go that day. So I guess I'm not going to go the next day and well, maybe not the next day either. So instead, what we recommend is identifying really small steps. So instead of we're going to transform our whole sex life in one weekend, a, you know, what is one thing small and specific that we can really commit to? And so for us, like one example is that we've had a lot of success with trying to do like a small daily routine. For me, the way my brain works, if I get into my head about like, yeah, I want to do something on a daily basis. Again, it's not a whole like I'm making the commitment to the gym every single day for this entire year, <laughs> but a daily thing like in my brain can work really nicely. So trying to remember little things that we can do with each other, things that take like 30 to 60 seconds kind of stuff. So really identifying like a baby step. I think another element of this is incorporating incorporating gratitude and positive feedback when things do go right. And I think that's something that we tend to forget about, you know, like our brains are, are wired to sort of identify things that go wrong and call those out rather than things that go right. But especially when we're trying to be making changes, it's so important, even if the little changes are super tiny or maybe don't even feel that meaningful yet, but you know, it's a step in the right direction is trying to, trying to call out, Hey, that would, you know, that was so nice that you, uh, you know, that you came home 15 minutes early and we got to check in about our day. I felt, I felt so seen. I felt so much closer to you or like, God, like, I really appreciated that we took our time a little more with the foreplay. You know, that was, that was so exciting for me. I got really, I got really excited, you know, by the time we moved on to the next event or whatever. So just really trying to lay it on pretty heavy, honestly, <laughs> with positive feedback, because that's the thing that is really going to solidify those changes. And then I'm also all about a calendar reminder. So I think sometimes mm -hmm. like we will make a plan of like, okay, I'm going to initiate sex once in this next week. And then it's like, who can remember over the course of a whole week, like one thing that you want to do? I can't. And, and so I think there's no shame in setting ourselves up for success with actually putting in reminders. So they're like, for example, in the beginning of our relationship, I put calendar reminders to myself to give Xander a hug every day. Like he's a big touch person. He loves an unsolicited hug. And I just like, that was not something that I naturally thought to do. So I put it in my freaking calendar. And like, he didn't need to know that, but it, it created a little bit of structure for me to like, oh yeah, let me go find him and hug him. Yeah. And it doesn't mean any less to me <laughs> right. knowing that it was on our calendar. Not like my experience is still the same. I'm not expecting a hug. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when the calendar <laughs> reminder is. So I'm just getting a hug. It's great. He's so not piecing together. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, piecing I together. I, Hugs yeah. come at 2 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there was even a time where I had a reminder on my calendar to like, think about sex, like think about having sex with Vanessa. And, you know, it's like, yeah, there, it, it took me so long to get to the point where I was like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to do this. Cause I had this feeling like, oh, well, it's supposed to just come naturally. Like mm -hmm. it's supposed to be spontaneous, but I mean, not that much life is really actually truly spontaneous. Now, the, you know, what I've found now is that, you know, we run this business together. We talk about sex all day. So I'm thinking about sex <laughs> a lot. I don't find myself needing calendar reminders for it. So, you know, that hope that that might be some motivation for people to try to start incorporating talking about sex on a daily basis, because you'll be thinking about it a lot more. You don't need to be talking about it all day long. Like we do, you don't have to go into <laughs> this field in order to have a great sex life, but just talking about it a couple of times, even just sending a couple of flirty text messages back and forth, like during your work day can do wonders. And a great prompt for that too, is actually just to follow our Instagram account. We're at Vanessa and Xander. Xander is, an, is with an X. Um, so we do stories every day and that can just be a great reminder for yourself of like, oh yeah, here's my little, you know, 60 seconds to think about sex. And maybe we share something that you can use to open up a conversation with your partner. Like, oh, they were talking about initiation today and they had this tip that I'd never thought of before. What do you think yeah. about that? So good. And when you first started speaking, um, what I was noticing and I mean, this won't come as a shock, I'm sure to our listeners, is that all of the things that you were saying are intimacy building that don't that didn't directly involve sex. 
only at the mm-hmm. end where you was talking about actually thinking about it and talking about it more and all, and all of that. But initially it was ways to feel closer to the other person, you know, mm-hmm. ways to feel intimate, you know, to open that vulnerability. And it's like, okay, well, if I'm feeling um, connected with you and like you are hearing me and feeling me and seeing me and you're not judging me and I'm not judging you, then we're able to to lay it all out. We're able to really connect um, in a way that will lead to non-steamed broccoli sex, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> you know, because when you don't do those things, a lot of times it's the A leads to B leads to steamed broccoli sex. But if it's we took time with each other. We showed that we care about the other person, that we care about ourselves, um, you know, and and essentially go out of our way in order to please the other person in the ways that they want to be pleased. And and uh, it's that's what that's the good good that leads to the great sex. And so, you know, I have these conversations all the time about how to spice it up and how to try new things. And you know, I think that there's a big piece in that is like educating yourself on what's available. But then what? You've educated yourself and you know what's possible for other people, but how do you make that leap from, I've learned about it, I've read about it in a book, I listened to a podcast about it, and now we're actually going to try it. It's having that foundation of closeness. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's got to be with someone that you are promised forever with. You can establish really beautiful closeness and intimacy with someone that is exclusively a play partner, or that is someone that you you know are having an intimate experience with for a week and then you're never going to see them again, or it's like a sexy vacation or something like that. Granted that has, that's hot in ways that, you know, are unique to it, not necessarily what, what we've got in five, 10, 15, 20 plus year marriages. Um, but you know, still really important and exciting and spicy and fulfilling nonetheless. So love that. And I love the reminders too, you know, I think people can make stories about, oh, well, if he's got to put a reminder, then, you know, that tells you everything you need to know about our relationship. That's that's fucking bullshit. It's bullshit. Do Mm -hmm. what you got to do. Yeah. Do what you have to do. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, my, my, my retort to the whole, like, you know, like that tells you everything you need to know kind of (laughs) thing is like, if, if like, do you work in it? Do you for work? Do you have a work calendar? Do you have like your meetings on a calendar? Do you like, <laughs> like, of course you do. No one goes, oh, well, in order to be successful at this job, you got to memorize the entire calendar. You have to know a month from now, you know, the meeting that I just verbally scheduled with you. Like nobody does that. I actually like to make a comparison for any parents listening with like how you might show up for your kids. So like, let's say your kid has a soccer game that is important to you and you want to be there. You're not going to just leave it to chance that you're going to happen to be free at that time. And like, oh yeah, well, if I feel like going in the moment, I'm going to go like, no, you put that game on your calendar. You protect that time. You make sure you don't schedule anything else around it. So, you know, we create that structure to show up for kids. So why can't we create that structure to show up for our partners? Yeah, absolutely. And creating that structure, I think is important also for people to do for themselves. You know, you have, Mm -hmm. I think that that winds up and that's a whole other conversation, but people pouring from empty cups, you know, and that's, that's tough too, when it comes to wanting to be intimate, because it's like, well, I'm, I'm not even giving to myself and taking space and calming my nervous system and taking time, you know, to care for myself. And then you also need from me. Um, And so that's, that's, I guess, another little additional sprinkle on here is that, um, you know, all of these things are important for you and your intimacy with the person, but also make, take stock and and double check, you know, where can you also show up for yourself a little bit more? Because I think if people are not pouring their last drop you know, into their person, Mm -hmm. um, then, then that leads to really sexy sex too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. You two great convo about convos. Thank you so (laughs) much. Is there, um, anything else that you feel really moved to share with our audience? Like if we just stop recording now, you would go, but wait, there's this other thing. (laughs) I just hope that we can leave your community with the understanding that whatever challenges they might be experiencing in their intimacy are very normal and common. I promise you, you're absolutely not alone in it. And the vast majority of things really can be fixed. It just takes us getting the courage, which I hope we have 
started to plant the seed for that, you know, getting the courage to be able to talk about these things. Like we really truly believe so passionately that being able to talk about intimacy and sex and closeness is the key to creating that connection that we are all so deeply craving. And it can be a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> it can be a lot more fun than you might be thinking. <laughs> That is my husband's sacred role in my life is what you just did, Xander. I was like, <laughs> and it also can be fun. I'm like, no, but it's gotta be hard. <laughs> no, it's gotta be, it's gotta be, you know, like I gotta work for it. And he's like, nope, it can also be fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we are big believers in the power of fun over yeah. here. Yeah, well, I love it. Thank you both for sharing your love story, your knowledge, your wisdom your realness, um, and congratulations to you both on an incredible book launch. Um, I'm so thrilled to share all of it with our audience, and I can't wait to hear what they think and um, what happens for their relationships um, from being introduced to you two, your social channels, and of course, the book as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would love to connect with anyone from your community over on Instagram. And if they want to check out Sex Talks, you can find the information at sextalksbook.com. We have links to all the major retailers to purchase it there. And if you come back to that page and fill out your information, we'll also send you a free workbook that goes along with it. Awesome. We love a good workbook. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you both again. Thank oh, you. Thanks.